Let's take our Bibles tonight and turn to 1 Peter. We're in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 tonight. And I'm going to read verses 13 through 17. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. We have a command. It says in verse 13, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the King. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity tonight to learn about our responsibilities and privileges as Christian citizens. Thank you, Lord, that you've not left us without clear directions. I want to thank you, Holy Spirit, for the words that you have written and preserved that we might know the mind and the heart of the Lord concerning every aspect of our life. Lord, help us to be obedient, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Isn't it interesting how certain words elicit certain responses from people? And there are some very good words, and there are some words that mama would wash your mouth out with soap over. But here's a word that a lot of folks have come to to, to not appreciate. They've come to not appreciate so much, and that is the word submit. Submit. In fact, in some circles, it's almost a dirty word. People don't want to submit. To submit means that we don't get to do everything we want to do just when we want to do it and the way we want to do it, wherever we want to do it, with whomever we want to do it. Submit means we're responsible to, and we must be accountable to an answer to somebody else. To submit means I'm not in charge of everything. To submit means to recognize that somebody else is the person to whom we answer. So we are to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Now we see how it's used here. But we remember that the theme of the entire book of 1 Peter is serving God in spite of suffering. Serving God in spite of suffering. That's persecution, that's problems, challenges, difficulties, some caused by others, some caused by ourselves, all uh, permitted by God and so forth. And we are to still be a servant in spite of the fact that we are suffering. Now it's difficult to be a servant when we're suffering. But it's even more difficult to be a servant when we are suffering at the hands of the very ones that's causing us to suffer and we have to submit. This is not easy. But that, in effect, is what the Apostle Peter is writing by inspiration to us about. As it's used here, the word submit means to place ourselves voluntarily, place ourselves voluntarily in a certain order under a certain organization. That's what it means. In this case, it's human government. We have other passages of Scripture that deal with our obedience to human leadership. We have, of course, Romans chapter 13, which speaks about how important it is for us to be obedient for our testimony's sake, for conscience and for testimony's sake. There is Hebrews chapter 13, which speaks of our being uh, in obedience to and respectful of those whom the Lord has placed in leadership over us, including in the church. 
There are those to whom we owe our obedience in that respect. And so this word submit is used in that respect that we should be obedient to certain human leaders. It's also used in Scripture, interestingly enough, of the example of Jesus Christ as a 12-year-old being in submission as a child to His parents. That same word. So with that same word and with that same thought as Jesus Christ, who was in submission, and you know, as the Son of God, He was perfect and sinless. So in sinless, perfect submission, Jesus Christ gives us an example of how we are to submit to human leadership. Now, it's confession time. True confession time. I've got my hand raised already, so you won't be embarrassed. How many of you have a very independent streak. The hands are going up, yes. How many of you didn't raise your hands because you have a very, very independent streak? Yes. And one of our first reactions humanly is, what you trying to tell me to do? Right? Who are you to try to tell me what to do? Tell me how to do it. Tell me what to... That's our first reaction many times, isn't it? Come on now. Come on. That's it. That runs deep with some of us for various reasons. And that's why we must be led of the Holy Spirit because it's going to take a spiritual transformation in order for us in our everyday lives to submit when God says we're supposed to submit. Not only do we have the example of Jesus Christ submitting. But we also have those scriptures. Now, here's where it almost becomes a dirty word for some. You've heard so many messages on this, haven't you? Where the wife is to submit to the husband. That does not mean that she is a second-class citizen or that she is a slave to her husband. The scripture is very clear that husbands and wives are team members. They are partners together in the grace of God in the home. That's very important. Here's where it comes down. Sometimes there's not 100% total agreement. I know this is a shock. Sometimes there's not 100% total agreement between husband and wife. And I know you're gasping right now. But when a call has to be made, and it's a tough call, I tell you what, the responsibility lies at the feet of the husband. The buck stops with him. That's very clear in the Word of God. And so most, I would say most of the discussions we've had over the course of our 48 plus years together, uh, we've agreed on the outcome. But on those few occasions when we have not agreed, she is very gracious. We made at least one, if not two moves in our life that she was not wholeheartedly yippy in favor of, but she went along and was very gracious, and she was what a wife was supposed to be. And after I realized I had made a really stupid mistake, she was even more gracious and didn't say, I told you so. She didn't do that. She doesn't have that in her vocabulary. And so we have the example of a wife being in submission to the husband in those, on those tough calls, those difficult times. Also, the word submit is used in regard to the way servants should obey masters. Servants should obey masters. And once again, all of these are different from one another. The obedience, the submission that's spoken of here, has the meaning of voluntarily placing oneself under the order or organization of authority. And here we read about human government. Do you know there was a time in the patriarchal age before human government was established and then God saw fit to establish human government. He established the home first. The first institution is the family. The next institution as such is human government. The final 
uh, institution that we focus on is the institution of the local church. All three of these given by God, designed by God, described in the scriptures so that we would not be out in the dark. You don't have to wonder what kind of a church we ought to have. I'll tell you what kind of a church we ought to have. A Bible-believing, Bible-behaving church. Right here, this is our final authority for faith and practice. And where we are in any way out of line with it, it straightens us out. Now, I would say the same thing for the home. We need to have Bible-believing, Bible-behaving homes. God established the home. We need to have Bible-believing, Bible-behaving government. Sadly, we do not have that. We've had many imperfect forms of government on earth. And ours, though ours in the United States of America is a, is a great, great thing that God has blessed us with. It's still far from perfect. We still have our foibles and our difficulties and our imperfections. And we won't have a perfect government until Jesus Christ comes back to rule and reign a thousand years upon the earth in the millennial reign. I'm looking forward to it. The kingdom of our Lord, the kingdom of is going to be established one day, and Jesus Christ is the king. In the meantime, we don't have a king. No, Donald Trump is not our king. Barack Obama before him was not our king. Uh, George W. Bush before him was not our king. Bill Clinton before him was not our king. George H. W. Bush before him was not our king. Ronald Reagan before him was not our king. Gerald Ford before him was not our king. Richard Nixon before him was not our king. LBJ before him was not our king. John F. Kennedy before him was not our king. Ike was not our king. And I could go back, Truman, and I could go back further. You want me to keep going? I can keep going. I can do it. I can do it. None of these men, even though there were times when our government was first established, it was thought that we might possibly have a, a, a monarchy with George Washington as our first king. That was actually considered after the revolution. And I'm so glad that those men who were, who were quartered there in Philadelphia trying to put it together, I'm glad when they came out and somebody said, what kind of a government have you given us? And Ben Franklin said, a republic if you can keep it. A republic if you can keep it. The rule of law, representative government, not perfect, but not bad. Not bad. Not a bad government. No, but it won't be perfect until Jesus Christ comes back. In the meantime, we are to submit ourselves. And the closest thing we have to a king, a secular king, would be the Constitution of the United States of America. So, on a scale of 0 to 10, 10 being the most important, you may not put your politicians... Your, your public servants up there around 10. But I put the Constitution of the United States right up there between 9 and 10. And they built into the Constitution the potential to correct terrible wrongs, mistakes that were previously made. For example, you know the great mistake of our founding fathers was to permit slavery. That was the great mistake. And there were some at the founding of our nation, even before the Constitution, who, when the Declaration of Independence was, was first uh, signed, they thought that perhaps slavery should be ended. The, the influence of the Southern planters was so great, and the fear that there would be a civil war then kept them from doing that. And so by expediency, we had slavery for another 80-some years. But praise God. That was corrected. It's still not perfect. There's still racism in America. I don't care what you say. There's still racism. Now, there's no racism here. There's no racism around us here. But that still exists. Governmentally, we can't solve every person's heart like Jesus can, like the Bible can. We've got a government that is basically good, basically right, with imperfect people, and striving to do some good things that will be ideal, idealistically never totally attained. But what, what should we do? Well, let's take a page from the scriptures here. 
When Peter was writing, what kind of government did they have then? Does anybody remember Nero? Not exactly your poster child for fairness and equity. A great persecutor of the Christians. So much so that many died horrible deaths. And yet... Peter writes God's words and says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. He's talking about our spirit, our attitude. We should be law-abiding people, not lawbreakers. Let me put it another way. The fact that we have spiritual liberty should never become the cloak that we use to be disobedient people, to be unruly, non law-abiding citizens. We should never allow our Christianity to become our excuse. You can't tell me what to do. You know, 35 miles an hour, 45 miles, I'll drive as fast as I want to. If they don't want me to drive over 45, they shouldn't make it so it can go over 45. I wouldn't be surprised one of these days they invent something, that'll, a kill switch that'll keep you from going over 45. That could happen too. But you understand that we have law for a reason. The other half is law and order. Order. Organization. We're to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man, notice, for the Lord's sake. Say, I'm not going to do it for him or her, but I'll do it for Jesus. I'll be a law-abiding Christian citizen for Jesus, for the sake of Jesus. That's it. That's it. Now, in those cases when there is an unjust or an immoral or an unbiblical law, then what do we do? We're going to look at this in just a moment. Very important for us to understand that the general tenor of this is we need to be known as law-abiding because you know what Nero did and what the other Roman emperors did. They blamed it on the Christians. If there was a problem, they blamed it on the Christians. If, I mean, if there was a plague, they blamed it on the Christians. If there was uh, some kind of insurrection, they blamed it on the Christians. And the Christians were not to blame, but they were being blamed. And so Peter is writing, we should not give them reason to blame us. We should be so much law-abiding citizens that they would say, oh, that can't possibly be. Those Christians, are you kidding me? Why, those people, they, when it says 35, they drive 35. Now, we can't all say that, can we? But it's important that we don't get a reputation of being so independent and, you know, so much uh, where we, you know, just demand our rights. Oswald Chambers, one of the great number, number one, two, or three of my favorite authors outside of the Bible, Oswald Chambers used to say, we need to lose our rights to ourselves. We need to lose our rights to ourselves and let people know that we are submissive and let people know that we are law-abiding. How important is that? So submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. Now what this teaches us is sometimes have you ever... Now I, I'm... Generally, generally, I want you to know I've not had a problem with this. But every once in a while, there may be a law enforcement person who is a rogue. That is possible. Or who is overzealous. And that would be a minority of the time. But it will happen when they go too far, when they're, when they're out of line, and so on. They've got the badge on, they've got the uniform on, they've got the authority, and they put you on the ground. I'll never forget our uh, evangelist back in California. He and another man were doing visitation and they decided they had leftover flyers and so they decided to, to go hit uh, the, all the parking lots and put literature on the cars. And so they're going around putting in the cars. And they got done and they thought, my, that was good. That felt good. They'd gone door to door. They had witnessed. They'd been soul winning. They put it on the cars. And they got in their vehicle and they started up over the bridge to come back into the little place where, where we live, where we lived at that time. 
And all of a sudden they looked up and woo, 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 woo. And they were pulled over. And two of the finest of the local police pulled them out and put that evangelist on the ground with his hands behind his back like this. Had him down on the ground. Turned out they were responding to a complaint because they were seen in the parking lot going from car to car. And it was assumed that they were doing something illegal, maybe stealing or trying to do so, steal a car or do something. And so th they overreacted, put them down. Now, what did our evangelist do? He treated them with respect, even though they didn't treat him totally as he ought to be treated. But they were taking extra precautions. They were a little overzealous. All right. So did he sue them? No, he didn't sue them. Didn't throw the book at them. Didn't do any of that. Why? I'll tell you why. Because he survived it. Also, his heart was in his throat at that time. And he couldn't form the words, <laughs> I'm going to sue you. But truthfully, there are times when there's an overreaction of those who represent the law. Those that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. Keep in mind, they've seen so much evil. There is so much criminality. There is so much going on in this world that doesn't get caught. Do you know... Just B and E, breaking and entering. B and E, they say you get caught one out of 60-something times. Now, don't try it because you'll get caught. You're a born-again Christian. God's going to let you get caught the first time probably. So don't do it. It's wrong. You shouldn't do it. But that's why people keep on breaking and entering. That's why people keep on, uh, you know, using and distributing and, and doing what they shouldn't do illegally. All right, so there are those people that we need to be submissive to, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Who are the ignorant and foolish ones of which Peter speaks? There are people who have nothing better to do. Now, they themselves would never do anything that would cause them to have to go to court, and go to jail, but they love to sit around and accuse everybody that they possibly can. And Christians, in their mind, would represent a target of, of those whom they might criticize and they might accuse. And we don't want to give those people anything to talk about. Now it says, As free and not using or abusing or misusing your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. So there you have it. There you have it. Now, what is the exception? The, the rule is we're to be law-abiding citizens. We are as a way of life, as a pattern of living. We are to be known, we're to have a reputation of being obedient to those who are in authority, showing respect, going the extra mile. You say, I don't want to do that because I know that and whatever you got in your mind, whatever your excuse is, whatever your reason is, remember what the Scripture says and we are to obey the scriptures. Now go to Acts chapter 5, please. Acts chapter 5, and of course the apostles were hauled in for preaching the gospel. All right, and in Acts chapter 5, in verse 28, did we not straightly, did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name, and behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine? I like that. That's a whole message in and of itself. You've filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. That's what we should want as a goal to be said of us. We've filled Woodbridge with the truth of the Word of God. Amen. And intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Well, actually back there in Matthew, what is it? Uh, in Matthew's Gospel, they said, His blood be upon us and our children. All right. Now here it is. Verse 29. Verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, Read it with me. We ought to obey God rather than man. So this does not say, whenever man says something, we ought to disobey it. No, what it is saying is, we obey authority except when that human authority attempts to coerce us to disobey God. So I obey, I keep on obeying. I keep on, I may, I may say, you know, it is really hard, but I'm going to keep on obeying. I'm going to pray for God's grace. I'm going to do it. I'm going to drive the speed limit. I'm going to observe the laws, the rules, 
the, the ordinances of man. I am going to live in this country according to the laws of this country, even if other people are breaking the law and are, are lawbreakers and illegal and, and doing things they shouldn't do. I'm still going to do what's right. I don't care what anybody else says. For, for the cause of Jesus Christ, I'm going to do it. And then they say, now we want you to, and they tell you to do something that's against the Bible. They want you to, for example, they want to coerce you, force you to pay for the death of babies in the womb. And you say, no, I'm not going to do it. And they say, well, how is that different? We're accepting the consequences. We have a government in which we have the potential to change bad laws. We can do it by electing enough good people, by petitioning by doing whatever we've got to do, by peacefully protesting. We can change bad laws. And then when it comes to trying to coerce us to do what we know is wrong, we are not, for example, as a church, we are not going to accept anything from the government which would cause us to have to obey the government when it comes to things like... Uh, the violation of the Word of God with respect to life and uh, with respect to what is moral and what is pure and what is right. If, if they tell us you've got to do that, we say, no, we're not going to. And if, <clears throat> if they padlock our church building, then we don't shoot them, but we cut the lock and come in and have church. Say, but if you cut the lock and come in and have church, they might arrest us. Well, arrest me first. <clears throat> so at least I'll be down there holding the service when you get there and they fingerprint you and check you in. And you'll be hearing me down the hallway say, the Bible says. Now that's an extreme thing. We pray that it never happens. But if it were to happen, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's it. I'm looking right into the camera and I'm saying it to you so you understand. We are law-abiding people. As a pattern of life, we obey the laws of the land. We acknowledge the authority that God has established. God has blessed America. We are proud and pleased to be law-abiding Christian citizens of this nation. But if you tell me to break what God says in His law... I will decline, and you can take me away. It's just that simple. It's that simple. I will not violate the Word of God. Now, living as free citizens, yet as servants of God. Put it down. Living as free citizens, yet as servants of God. Every Christian has to render unto Caesar the things of Caesar. Matthew 22, verse 21. But we must also render unto God the things that are God's. He is a higher authority than the state. And when we pledge allegiance, I'm so glad. One nation under God. That's it. You say, but it's not a completely free nation. It's not a completely perfect nation. It's not a completely whatever nation. Fill in the blank. When I pledge, I pledge to the ideals represented by that flag under God. God, do you understand what I'm saying? Under God, I have no problem. I have no problem with that. Do what you want, but I have no problem with that. Knowing this, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers and fathers, fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, if there be any other that is contrary to sound doctrine. And so, we are to honor all men. Honor all men. That means that we respect and esteem every person, regardless of who they are, where they've come from, without respect to their background, without respect to their color, without respect to their language, without respect 
to their societal position, we ought to honor all men. All men. Now, I realize that we do not honor bad behavior, but we honor the person. And I've used this example before. When I used to take the boys uh, downtown, we would hit some of the back alleys uh, out in California, we'd find there'd be some fella, some wino sitting there next to, you know, a building or maybe uh, down toward the tracks. And we'd stop and I would say, sir, may I speak to you for a moment? And I would call him sir and I would speak to him respectfully. Why? Because even though he had done disservice to the creation of God, he is still a creature of God. He still deserves the respect that's due to a creature of God. And so I spoke to him and and would speak to anyone like that in terms of respect and try to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. Honor all men. Honor all men. I've been in the presence of those that did not believe in God or did not receive and believe in Jesus Christ as we do. We still honor all men because all are created by God. All are important. Every human being is important to God. Every human being represents great potential. And you never know what can happen if God gets a hold of their life. Amen. All right, so honor all men. Love the brotherhood. This becomes a little narrower circle, a concentrated circle. The brotherhood is made up of all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Everybody who's been saved the Bible way. Today I was talking with a, a theologian and an author and I said, I refer to those people from Adam until the end, as it says in Ephesians chapter 3, the family of God. And we honor all of them. doesn't matter if they belong to my church or if they belong to any church or ever belong to a church. If they've received Christ as their Savior, if they've trusted the blood of the Lamb for their salvation, then they're part of the brotherhood. And so we are to love the brotherhood. That means we're supposed to get along. That means we're supposed to sacrifice. We're supposed to surrender, do what we can. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God. That means reverential respect and fear. And we've kind of lost the fear of God. We need to restore that. We need to have reverential respect for God, for His names. Now, don't even text anything that stands for, oh my God. Don't even text that. Because God's name is to be revered. It's to be reverenced. All right? So don't even do that. Don't even take God's name lightly. Oh, my Lord, don't do that. Don't do that. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God. That means in our life, in our actions, in our thoughts, in our plans, in our decisions, we need to fear God. We need to have a reverential respect for God no matter what we decide. It's important because we belong to Him. We've been bought with a price. He has every right to tell us what to think, where to go, who to be with, what to decide, what to choose. He has every right to do that. We need to fear God. Honor the King. Now, this is tough. This is tough because in government, there's so much imperfection. But as I said, the closest thing we have in this republic to a king is not the president or the cabinet or the Supreme Court or Congress, either House of Congress. It's not that. The closest thing in this secular government we have to a king is the Constitution of the United States of America. There were times when I would carry a copy of the Bible in my pocket and also I would carry a copy of the Constitution. It's important that we know it. Most Christians do not know how their government is supposed to function. And you know that the founding fathers wrote into our documents so many things that remind us of the fact that we are accountable to Almighty God. Now, we didn't get, we didn't get our government just because there was mutual consent by a majority plus one of those that voted on any given measure. That's not how we got what we got. We got because we have a gracious God. We got the government that we have. And God has His hand upon us still. We may not be doing right things all the time. We might not be doing right things any of the time. But I believe that because of past generations, we're still under the cloud of God's covering and protection and, 
and care because there were some people who came before us on whose shoulders we are now standing. And we have the benefit of what they did in history so that the blessings are still coming down upon us. The only thing that's going to spare this nation then is an old-fashioned Holy Ghost heaven-sent revival. Can I get an amen? I don't believe anything else is going to spare us. One of these days, it's going to happen from within. It's going to, I don't know if it's going to be a civil war or if it's going to be a military coup or if it's going to be an invasion by one or several other nations. But the only thing that can spare this nation is Almighty God. We need to look to Him. That's why this listing in the last verse, verse 17, is so very important. Oh, that we would fear God. Amen. Oh, that we would fear God. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Every head bowed. You've been viewing a service at Central Baptist Church. We never dismiss the service without clearly presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is, that Jesus came to this earth and sinlessly lived for 33 years before he voluntarily gave his life. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose from the dead. And he's alive forevermore. Through the shedding of his blood and through his victory at uh, the, the empty tomb, Jesus Christ now offers salvation to you. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you pray right now from your heart to God and ask him to save you? Something like this, Dear God, just pray, Dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I deserve to pay for my sins. I deserve to pay for my sins. I believe Jesus died to save me. I believe Jesus died to save me. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Did you pray that prayer? Did you mean it? Wonderful. I want you to get in contact with us and let us know of your decision. Now, if you've already been saved, I want to encourage you to live the life that God would have you to live according to His Word. If you desire more instruction, more information, we'll be happy to supply it to you. We like to talk to you. The information is right here, and we'd love to speak to you. If you have any spiritual needs whatsoever, may God bless you.